<laughs> well, in case you missed it last time, there it is again. All right, hopefully you have a full page nuclear again up on the screen here. This is the uh, measurement uh, subject line version of uh, nuclear um, measurement. This is specific to measurement. So we're going to look at some of the stuff we've seen uh, in the previous lecture again, but uh, some more uh, information here that's relevant to uh, how we use nuclear sources uh, at, at work for, uh, for measurement devices. So there's some safety stuff in here, regulatory stuff in here, and then uh, some more practical uh, applications that we would see um, at work. Okay, rationale here, many industries use measurement with nuclear technology. Uh, measurement of density, level, and mass are three process variables that are measured by nuclear instruments, uh, which we install and maintain. Objectives, uh, five of them in this ILM here. So we start out with regulatory bodies for nuclear sources, then principles and applications used in nuclear instruments, uh, instrument uh, installation requirements for these instruments, methods for calibrating, uh, these instruments, and then last but definitely not least, uh, the required safety considerations when working with and around uh, radioactive sources. And really, uh, of all of them, this is probably the one that's most uh, important. Uh, you, you don't want to play around with nuclear sources too much. And as I was telling um, one of you earlier here in the 30-ish years I've been doing this, I've only had the opportunity to be uh, involved in working on one, and we're going to find out why. Okay, so measurement of level density and mass can be done with nuclear instruments. We're going to look at radiation uh, as a level measurement tool. Um, we will review how radiation occurs and talk about radioactive decay and the different types of radiation. Uh, we're going to learn how we apply uh, those characteristics to measurement, and most importantly, again, we're going to learn how to protect ourselves uh, from the effects of radiation. So starting out now with uh, regulatory requirements. So of course, uh, nuclear, uh, very dangerous. So highly legislated and regulated. Anything in Canada is handled by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission uh, in accordance with the Nuclear Safety and Control Act. Um, if you uh, have nuclear devices on your site or if a company uses radiation, they are required to employ a special person uh, called the radiation safety officer who is responsible for the radiation safety program and all of the nuclear sources and licensed activities uh, that they intend to use those sources for uh, in their facility or company. And that's the main reason why you don't often get to work on them. Okay, applications when a nuclear instrument is used, it is typically used when other technologies do not perform well. It is, again, uh, inherently more dangerous and therefore it's only used when necessary, um, mainly applications where other devices wouldn't do the job as well. Um, some examples, soil density, measuring the thicknesses of metals, uh, fill levels for food and drugs or other non-contact uh, style level measuring devices, um, and we'll discuss uh, the, these measurement devices, level and density gauges later on in this ILM. So continuing on with a quick little uh, review here about uh, atoms and isotopes and protons and neutrons and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we remember that the atom consists of uh, electrons and protons and neutrons, um, and there's set numbers of each depending on the, the element that we're talking about and we learned in a previous lecture that if we have uh, isotopes uh, it means that they have the same number of protons and, and electrons but have varying uh, numbers of neutrons if it is one of these types of atoms we call it an unstable atom or an unstable isotope and these are the isotopes that decay in the form of radiation and this is the radiation that we use uh, for measurement. Uh, you'll notice later as you spend more time with the periodic table uh, that most large atoms uh, have isotopes that are very unstable. And you may not discover that actually, it's kind of next level, but the, the higher the atomic number of an element, the more uh, isotopes it generally has 
and as a result, it'll have more uh, unstable uh, isotopes. So again, these are all isotopes, same number of protons, different number of, of neutrons, and that's how we get the number of carbon-12 is from these two numbers, carbon-13 is from those two numbers, carbon-14, from those numbers, and that reflects back on that AZX notation that we looked at uh, in the chemistry version uh, of, of nuclear radiation. So that carries over. Okay, so these unstable isotopes, they uh, decay uh, into a more stable form and, and the energy that is emitted as they decay uh, travels in a straight line and we use that for measurement and we call it a source. Um, this energy is then measured by a detector um, that detects the amount of uh, energy that uh, is being received versus the amount of energy that had been sent uh, and by some physical uh, characteristic of the a process that's being measured, uh, some of that nuclear energy is absorbed and then we get a difference between uh, what is sent and what is received and that is by and large uh, the general operating procedure for a nuclear device. Hit, uh, we'll hit the three common sources again. So this is peer review of the chemistry uh, module where we talked a little bit about the uh, three major uh, radioactive uh, uh, isotopes or, or uh, types of radioactive decay that we uh, deal with here. So alpha, beta, uh, and gamma again, and we learned 4 over 2 and 0 over 1 and 4 over 2 He, and then we learned about uh, alpha traveling in a straight uh, line like a beam, uh, beta same way, and then gamma traveled in a wave. And then there was a different uh, amounts of penetrating power that is associated with each of these types of radiation, alpha being the weakest, gamma uh, being the strongest. And you can see uh, the usable applications uh, for, for this one here, since it can go through things like paper, uh, wood, concrete, et cetera, whereas these ones are rather weak. So here's the alpha particle one more time. Um, consists of two protons and two neutrons, and then they only travel a short distance uh, before being absorbed. And I'm not going to talk much more uh, about that because we have covered this before. Beta particle, uh, we made it beta particles consist of electrons due to the decay, of, uh, the decay of neutrons into a proton and electron. And this is all wonderful and marvelous, but don't hurt yourselves on that. Uh, just be... Um, generally familiar again with these types of uh, particles. Okay, these particles only travel a short distance as well uh, before they are absorbed. Uh, for example, one mega electron volt, which is a unit of measure, will travel about three meters uh, in air. Last but not least, uh, let's put that in perspective here with the gamma ray. Uh, it's the form of a wave and not a, a particle that shoots in a straight line. Uh, they'll travel large distances even through dense material. Uh, because of this, it is the most common used in measurement. As a comparison here, one mega electron volt will travel about 80 meters in air before losing half of its intensity. So significantly more uh, powerful and also uh, as such a little bit more dangerous. Okay, size matter. Uh, alpha particles larger, beta particles smaller. Gamma uh, rays are uh, even smaller, I guess, in comparative relationships here. Uh, in the, the ILM, uh, they also mentioned, just like in the previous ILM, a bunch of different types uh, of radiation. But uh, the main one we're concerned with, again, is the, is the gamma radiation, uh, because that's the one we use uh, mostly in measurements. All right, here are some common radioactive isotopes that are used in industries, different industries. Um, and some of their common uh, uses. Uh, and these are the main three that you'll have to be familiar with. Um, um, just general characteristics uh, as you go through the PowerPoint uh, presentation here today, pay attention to things that are uh, kind of related to these three different uh, radioactive isotopes. So cesium-137 uh, used for measuring flow. A uh, common application is the under, underground oil wells, also used for measuring sensitivity, uh, sorry, soil density uh, and fill levels in the food and uh, beverage industry. Cobalt-60, sterilizing hospital equipment, pasteurizing foods, uh, measuring the thicknesses of metals. Uh, americium-241, 
fluid level and density, thickness gauges, fuel gauges in aircraft, which is kind of interesting, smoke detectors. You could probably walk through your house uh, today, anytime you want, pop your smoke detector off, look at the sticker on the back, and you will see an identification and a little logo uh, indicating that this is the type of radiation that's in your smoke detector. Uh, also, distance uh, sensing devices. So, lots of different uses uh, for radiation in the measurement uh, field. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of uh, radioactivity uh, and some of the measures that we use um, to deal uh, or to quantify and qualify radioactivity. <clears throat> so activity uh, is the rate of radioactive decay in disintegrations per second. So when, when something decays, we look at it in terms of disintegrations per second or how many times it comes apart. Uh, per second and releases these uh, these particles, we'll, we'll say. Um, the unit that describes this is called the Becquerel and describes the number of disintegrations per second. Um, this is the unit we're most concerned with here. Uh, just for informational purposes here in the United States, they use something called a Curie. Uh, when I was in school uh, in, in your position uh, back in third year, way back when, uh, we only talked about the, the curry. This was not a, a thing yet, but uh, the times have uh, changed, of course. Okay, so uh, half life is an important characteristic um, of a radioactive isotope, and the half life is defined as the time that it takes for half of the nuclei in a sample to decay, or to lose half of its strength, essentially. Uh, some examples, uh, and this is a point of interest for us because there are questions. Uh, on this in uh, quizzes and exams and self-tests, if I recall correctly. Um, cobalt-60, for example, has a half-life of about 5.3 years. Cesium-137 has a half-life of about 30 years. Um, Americium-241 uh, has a half-life of about 433 years. So significantly uh, different characteristics. Um, back in the day, uh, I remember uh, exams and we had to remember, uh, we had to remember these numbers and the associated uh, radiation form for to tests and quizzes and things like that. Um, I think now most of the time this information will be given to you in in your questions, um, but it doesn't hurt, you know, to kind of generally remember these three. Okay, uh, radium uh, 226 again, like 1600 years, so a long time for it to, to decay. So, what does the question related to this half life kind of look like? It looks like this um, cobalt 60 source has an activity of 100 mega becquerels, so 100 million becquerels per second. What is the activity after 10.6 years? Well, if we know that its half life is 5.3 years, uh, we we can do the math. So we're starting out with 100. After 5.3 years, we're going to lose uh, half of it. So we're going to be down to 50 megabecquerels. After another 5.3 uh, years or 10.6 years, we lose another half of that. So we're down to 25 megabecquerels. So not very uh, difficult to do. Uh, no complex equations or anything like that. So that's a half-life calculation uh, based on some type of radioactive. Uh, element. Okay, energy uh, describes the uh, the energy um, put out by the radioactive uh, isotope here. So the unit that is used for energy is the joule, and radiation intensity is the amount of energy passing through an object perpendicularly in a given unit time. So if you shoot radiation at something, um, that is what they describe as radiation intensity or the measurement of the intensity at that, uh, at that uh, presentation of being perpendicular. Um, exposure, probably one that's more important to us. Um, the energy and all that kind of stuff is all great, but exposure is something that you really need to be concerned with. Uh, if you've been exposed to radiation, we call it a dose. How bad is the dose? It depends. Um, we'll talk about this in much more detail moving uh, ahead in this presentation. The SI unit for uh, exposure is a Coulomb uh, per kilogram, um, and you'll see there's a whole bunch of units in this ILM, uh, and probably one of the more challenging parts 
uh, of the ILM is associating the uh, measurement unit with uh, what it's supposed to be uh, representing. Okay, so here's the absorbed dose, and this is uh, rather important because this is, uh, you know, what happens to us if we happen to be exposed to uh, radiation. We want to be able to quantify that, um, and it starts out with the absorbed dose. And I say it starts out with the absorbed dose because it gets a little more complicated than that. So the amount of energy absorbed by a substance such as you is called the absorbed dose and is represented by this large D. The absorbed dose is measured in a unit called the gray, which is represented by this GY. A dose of one gray is equivalent to one unit of energy, which we learned earlier is a joule, deposited in a kilogram of substance. So that's an absorbed dose. And that's relatively heavy, but don't let your, don't be overcome with this yet because it's about to change uh, again. Okay, the gray is a physical unit that tells us how much soaked into us or how much we are exposed to but it doesn't tell us how much or how bad it hurts because again there's different types of isotopes so just because uh, i got shot by the nuclear ray gun uh, of this type for two seconds and i got shot by the nuclear ray gun of this type for two seconds uh same dose two second dose but one of them could be much more dangerous than the other and that's what we're going to talk about next which is called the dose equivalent. So the absorbed dose, um, which is represented by H, don't become overwhelmed here, it boils, it boils down here in a second. Uh, it does not, as I said earlier, describe the degree of damage caused by a particular type of radiation. So in comparison here, let's look at that, what that means here. One gray of alpha radiation, for example, can do 20 times more damage as 100 grays of gamma radiation. So these are way out numbers, and I understand that you're probably at this point uh, rather confused as to uh, what's going on with all these units and all these numbers, but don't panic yet. Okay, um, we introduce now a new unit, because there weren't enough yet, uh, called the sievert. And this is the most important one, basically, that we've talked about in the last four slides, so hang on. The sievert was developed as an indication of that biological damage caused by radiation. So it's a, it's a unit that uh, converts uh, your, your dose into a dose equivalent, meaning uh, a comparable apples to apples measurement of the different types of uh, radiation. And how it works is it uses something called a weight rating. This is the WR on the, on the screen in this little table down here. And it applies a weight rating to the different types of uh, nuclear energy here. And, and you can see the different weight ratings that are applied. And guess what? We're going to use this table to do some calculations for dose equivalent. Okay, the dose equivalent is uh, this unit H, dose equivalent is H, and it's measured in the unit sieverts. Not the greatest representation of how to write it, but this is what it is. Dose equivalent H measured in unit sieverts is equal to the absorbed dose. Oh, sorry, the one from the previous slide, capital D, times our gray multiplied by a weight rating. So the formula itself is not uh, a complicated formula. Um, we just need to have a few numbers. So let's see. Uh, what that looks like. <clears throat> Again, remembering that this weight rating is equal to the, the quality factor or the potency uh, of a type of radiation. Okay, so let's have a looky look here. Uh, the, the radiation weighting factor is what we use to equate the different types of radiation's biological effectiveness or killing power, if you will. Uh, this weighted absorbed quantity is called the equivalent dose, and again, measured in that unit called a sievert. And here's what it is going to look like after all is said and done. Uh, a person receives a dose of two milligrays of gamma radiation, 0.6 milligrays of beta radiation, and 0.2 milligrays of high energy neutron radiation from different sources on a bad day. What is his total body dose? Total dose or a dose equivalent is going to be measured in sieverts, the common unit that, that equates or he uh, does uh, equivalency for all the different types of radiation that are measured here. Looks like this, right? So we'll take the dose rate of the one um, and the grays multiplied by the weight rating. 
and then the second one and then the third one. So let's see here. Okay, so uh, two milligrays times one, and I'm getting this one from uh, the table uh, from the previous slide here. So if we looked at gamma, uh, gamma, beta, and neutron. I'll just scroll back here real quick. Okay, gamma one, beta one, and neutron 10. So that's where those numbers come from. Do the math, and we add them all together because now they're equivalent units relative to each other. And we can say that your total uh, equivalent dose for your very bad day at work is 4.6 millisieverts uh, of radiation. Now, you're wondering, what am I going to do with all those things I just learned? Probably not much. Here's why. Uh, we most commonly use gamma radiation for instrumentation. So for most practical purposes moving forward, we are going to assume a weight rating of one. Therefore, one sievert is going to equal one gray. Okay, now we get into something called a, a dose rate, uh, another measurement of uh, the way nuclear energy moves. Uh, and it is used to express the amount of radiation absorbed over a period of time. Uh, it is written as millisieverts per hour. So the only thing uh, different here now is we, we have added that element of time. And we are now going to do a little exercise where we calculate the dose rate uh, through air and an example of a couple other materials using a handy dandy formula. Magical formula here, dose rate in millisieverts per hour. Again, this is a new number that we're discovering now. Uh, A is the activity in becquerels. K is the dose constant that will be given. Uh, and D is the distance in uh, meters. And this should be a small d, not a large d. I should edit that. My bad. Okay, so let's look at an example of dose rate. And uh, you might want to pull out your calculator for this and get onto page uh, nine in your ILM, if you have it handy um, because the calculator button procedure um, can be a little bit hairy scary. Um, so it's a good idea to kind of walk through it while I'm here so that you can uh, get the right answers. All right, so let's see what we got here. Uh, we're using the formula. We know we know uh, what the variables uh, mean by definition, uh, except for this constant for different types of radiation. So lucky for us, we're only going to deal with two uh, throughout the whole ILM. So they are cobalt-60 and cesium-137. Uh, these are their constants, 3.06 times 10 to the negative 10 and 7.61 times 10 to the negative 11. Uh, generally, uh, these will be given to you in any question uh, that requires them, um, not a lot of sense in memorizing something that you can quickly Google nowadays. So let's look at how this calculation rolls out. Calculate the dose rate of cesium-137, which is emitting 900 megabecquerels one meter from the source. So we look at the radio uh, the radioactive constant for that particular type of radiation, cesium-137 is 7.5. 6, 1 times 10 to the 11, and we'll plunk that in the formula for our K value. Um, our emissive, our dose um, emission uh, decay rate in becquerels is 900 million, or 900 times 10 to the 6, and we are one meter from the source, which is our D squared. Uh, running this through the old calculating machine there, uh, 7.61 the exponent button, the, the numbers, uh, the number 11, the negative sign, multiplied by opening bracket 900 exponent number six, divided by sign four x squared button, close bracket sign. There's a number of different ways you can punch this in and give you a number of different answers. So uh, make sure that you're comfortable um, running that through your calculating machine uh, because there's not much math in this ILM. So be sure that you're going to have to uh, perform some examples of uh, any of it. 
and I'll just pause here for a second so that you can uh, run it through your calculator. And if uh, someone succeeds, uh, just shout out and I will move to the next slide. I can only assume that you guys are participating, I guess. All right, at any rate, if you have issues, just come back to this slide uh, and this will help guide you uh, through that calculation. Where is this going? Well, we know that when we're using radiation as a measurement tool, uh, it comes in this fancy container, which we'll talk about later. Uh, that's like a you know cast iron camera for all intensive purposes. You open up a window on it, and now the radiation is shooting out of it. Um, but it's not just shooting into a well. Sometimes it is shooting into a pile of stuff. But lots of times, if we're using it for level, uh, we're measuring level inside of a vessel, which means that that radiation uh, has to shoot through the outside wall uh, of the vessel uh, first, and then it's got to go through the process medium that's in that vessel, and then it's got to go through the other wall. Uh, of the vessel in order to get to the detector. So somewhere along the way, um, it's losing uh, its intensity uh, and we have to be able to calculate that intensity. Then this is where uh, this is leading us. So this uh, calculation is uh, what we use to help us decide on what size of the source we're going to need. And this is the next uh, slide that we're looking at here. So long story short, we need to size the source so it has enough penetrating power to go through those vessel walls and the process. Different materials absorb different amounts of radiation. We saw earlier uh, paper, steel, concrete, lead, uh, you know, all those different things uh, absorb more or less radiation. Percent transmission uh, is, the, is the term that we use to describe the ratio of the intensity leaving versus what it was entering the material. And we have fancy dancy charts, and you better get used to these charts because, again, uh, there's math associated with this. Uh, so these charts tell us the transmissivity of materials. And what's missing uh, from these two graphics here is one of them is for uh, cobalt 60, and one of them is for cesium 137. Um, so uh, you'll be using these charts. Uh, in the next, uh, in this ILM uh, for some calculations. Um, but you can see here uh, transmission percentages for aluminum, for example, uh, at 25 centimeters thick. Uh, for here is, is 5% for this particular type of radiation, whereas 25 centimeters of aluminum uh, using this source uh, has 12% uh, transmission rate. So whatever this one is, uh, goes through aluminum uh, aluminum easier than, than this one does. And that's basically what we're trying to determine. So these charts is uh, what we're going to use for that. Okay, so how do we calculate this transmission rate? We use another uh, fancy formula here. Uh, transmission rate, or the dose through the media, uh, <clears throat> and the percent transmitted over 100% is the formula that we use for dose rate through anything other than air. Okay, and this is the exercise that we're dealing with. We're not worried about it through air. We're, we're worried about it going through uh, the vessels and the process, not necessarily through uh, air. So uh, again, DT is the dose rate through the media. Uh, DO is the dose rate through air. Uh, T is the media thickness. Uh, there's a little guy down there. Uh, where is that? I think this formula that we messed up a little bit. Uh, da, 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 da. Needless to say, uh, percent transmissivity uh, is off that graph. So here's what a question, uh, typical question would look like here. I think this is the example from the ILM. Uh, the intensity of cobalt 60 is 10 millivolts per hour. And don't worry about the units. Uh, determine the intensity after it passes through 60 centimeters of water, 12 and a half centimeters of steel, and 25 centimeters of steel. So this question really uh, encapsulates encapsulates uh, all the all the things that we're required to uh, to know in terms of transmission and transmissivity. Okay, so uh, we have to find out a few things uh, to put into this formula here. So what do we've got here? 
Uh, we've got 10 millilocals per hour, which is our DO. Um, we have to get our uh, percent transmittance off of some uh, graphs here. And we have, uh, what else do we have here? Uh, measurements, which we use on the graphs. So we're going to have to look at the graphs. So looking at the graphs, um, what is it for water? So 60 centimeters of water and cobalt 60. Oh, darn it. Okay, let's see which one uh, is right. 60 centimeters of water and cobalt 60. I'm not sure if this is the right chart or not, but let's go 60 centimeters. This is water. And if I went across there, it looks like it's about eight. Uh, I don't see anything here that looks like uh, eight. So that must be the wrong table. And let's go to this one, 60%. So I hit water and yeah, this one is more than 10, less than 20, so 15. So this would be that table. Uh, that's where I get that number from. So about 15% for water. So I put my 15% there over 100 times 10 uh, is 1.5 millimolkins per hour is what it is after it passes through uh, 60 centimeters of water. Now, doing the same thing uh, for 12 and a half centimeters of steel. Let's go find 12 and a half centimeters right about there and steel right about there. And we go across and it's 5% transmissivity. So we plunk our uh, magic number in there. Five over hundred times 10 uh, is 0.5 millilocons for hour per hour, sorry. Now we're gonna go back and we're gonna say, okay, through 25 centimeters of steel. So let's go back, whoops. Let's go back here and we'll go to 25 centimeters and steel. Wait a second, aluminum, something, something, something. Steel's way over here. I can't do that. How, what kind of a dumb question did he just ask me? This is impossible. No, it's not impossible. Uh, here's how you do this. To get through a material that is thicker than the graph shows, we've calculated in steps. So we did a calculation a minute ago uh, after 12 and a half centimeters, and it reduced from 10 down to 0.5 millimolkins per hour, which means that heading into the next thickness, the second 12 and a half centimeters, which gives us a total of 25, it starts at this new reduced value and then continues on using the same formula. So now uh, 5%. Uh, for steel at 12 and a half uh, centimeters over 100 times our uh, DO coming in, which has been reduced by the first 12 and a half centimeters, gives us our new number, which represents what's left after a combined uh, 25 centimeters of steel. So long drawn out calculation for uh, something uh, you may never do, but important to know how the radiation is, is reduced. And you'll notice that every thickness uh, that, we, that we went through, it didn't reduce by like a little bit. It was like an exponential reduction. And that's important uh, to remember as we move through the rest of this presentation. All right. So we looked at all these different doses here. Um, and this kind of combines uh, all of these units that we've looked at uh, so far. So activity measured in becquerels. Uh, energy, again, measured in joules, radiation shooting out uh, its, its uh, energy, uh, creating exposure, uh, which we measure in, in coulombs or rogans. But again, don't get too hung up on it. I, I don't get real deep into these. Uh, again, the major ones, uh, rogan, gray, and, and seaweed are the big ones. So absorb dose, what is its unit? The gray equivalent dose, what is its unit? the sievert, and then of course there's uh, very little math to go in between these ones. Um, so again, it's more about identifying the units and what we're trying to, trying to uh, quantify. So that was a uh, heavy theoretical part about uh, radiation uh, as far as measurement goes. Now we're going to get into some more practical uh, stuff here. Okay, so installation requirements. Uh, common applications for radiation, again, we've mentioned most of these earlier, uh, level, pure level or interface level, uh, density, and also for bulk solids. 
So let's look here at continuous level measurement uh, and how that works using, uh, using radiation here. So we have a vessel. Uh, we have a source on the outside of the vessel penetrating the wall of the vessel going through uh, the medium here, with combination of air and some kind of a fluid. Uh, and then we have a detector uh, here, or perhaps an array of detectors that you'll see as we go along. But at any rate, we have a long detector, which allows us to do continuous measurement or to get a range, uh, a range measurement, uh, which, we, which we're going to call continuous. Okay, the detector is located on the opposite tank, uh, and it measures the intensity of the radiation that has not been absorbed by the process media. So the measurements of the detectors uh, up here above the surface will have different uh, measurement numbers than the uh, portions of the detector that are down here. And by making a relative comparison between these two numbers and this number, we can determine where that level is. Okay, point level detection, uh, same uh, amount of hardware basically, except we have a much, much smaller uh, detector. Uh, point level de detection, uh, essentially a very expensive nuclear level switch. Oops, I'll just look at that again. So again, uh, just a point level detection, nothing, this does nothing whatsoever until the level uh, blocks the, the beam. So um, not a not a great use, uh, maybe, but I'm sure there's applications uh, for this. Okay, interface measurement. Uh, again, interface measurement just simply detects the difference in the densities as the interface uh, or the scene moves up and down. So again, the amount of energy absorbed by this process medium compared to the amount of energy absorbed by this process medium can be uh, can be uh, measured by the detectors uh, in relative proportion and give us uh, an indication of where that seam uh, is going. This detector, uh, externally mounted, as you see here, um, but hey, look at this. We can put uh, these things uh, internally too if we wanted to. So here we have the source and the detector outside. Here we have the source uh, on the inside and the detectors on the outside. So uh, different installation uh, opportunities there. Okay, density measurement here. Uh, got a detector going across a vessel, or in this case, uh, a pipe. And again, by measuring the uh, change in uh, radioactive strength uh, that due to the absorption uh, of the process and the piping here, we can gauge uh, the density uh, of, a, of a material as well. Okay, the result, resulting intensity of the detector is of course uh, proportional to uh, the density. Mass flow of bulk solids here, a rather unique application for uh, nuclear uh, measurement here. Uh, Non-contact measurement for harsh environments, uh, resistant to wear, uh, and can also use uh, the measurements to determine mass flow rate, which we'll talk about in a uh, separate subject much later in the, in the course here. Um, but a good application, again, non-contact, uh, abrasive uh, materials, things like that, a good application. <clears throat> And using algorithms, they can, uh, you know, they can measure the height of this and all, and the speed of the belt and so on and so forth. And that's how they get mass flow rate. But we don't get into it really uh, in in third year. But it is a potential uh, benefit of that device. All right, moving into construction uh, of the machines themselves. So looking at a general uh, radioactive source holder diagram here, some type of a big heavy duty. Uh, metal case with uh, some type of a shield. You see here, this is a, a lead rotor, uh, you know, kind of like a globe valve, if you want to say, or whatever it happens to be, but something that opens and closes. Uh, we have our source capsule surrounded by lead, uh, and we have a, a shutter on the outside or some kind of switch and shutter operation mechanism here where we can uh, rotate it so we can close off the beam and open the beam. Uh, it's made of two parts, uh, the locking source holder and the detector. And we'll talk about the detector uh, a little bit later. Okay, the source holder uh, is protected by a lead shield, as we saw in the previous diagram here. And by law, it uh, has to have this fancy sticker on it, which has the, the symbol that we all know so well. Uh, here's the name for it. It's called a trefoil, uh, and it must be present at 
present and a must have uh, a bunch of information on it as you see here identification the type of isotope date and the activity of that particular isotope so these are a couple more uh, real life uh, versions here but you can see this one uh, has a rotatable uh, shutter with a locking mechanism and that's something that obviously has to be in place so that no one comes and steals the radiation uh, to try to make a dirty ball. Okay, uh, the open close lever is used to open and close the shutter for maintenance and there's a bunch of things that are involved uh, when you're doing maintenance and have to, has to do with this shutter and how much faith uh, we have in this shutter. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Now, this is uh, detectors. So there's a few different types that we're going to talk about. A uh, Geiger-Muller tube type, uh, an ionization chamber, and a sodium iodine scintillator. Uh, these are the three that we're going to talk about, and they all do essentially the same thing in different ways. Uh, and they vary mostly in their technology, uh, construction, and application. So as we move into the next little set uh, of slides in the presentation here, just uh, make note of the uh, main technology that they're they're using uh, for the different detectors uh, and application type and uh, unique characteristics so again the detectors are across uh, from the source and they measure the intensity of the beam uh, that is remaining after it gets passed through the process medium first and first here we have the geiger mueller tube and the name may sound familiar uh, if you watch Bugs Bunny, uh, they use the Geiger counter, and that's the device that uh, they walk around with to measure uh, radiation that we see in, in movies and things like that. So Geiger-Muller tube uh, is a thin-walled metal tube filled with argon at about 14 kPa. And that's, I know, pretty specific, but you'll see why uh, in, the next, uh, in the next slide here. They're about half inch to three quarters in diameter, and the technology uh, behind them for our purposes without getting too silly. Uh, basically works on something called electron avalanche uh, caused by gas multiplication. And I like to just kind of paraphrase this uh, as the uh, I tell two friends, you tell two friends, they tell two friends, they tell two friends, they tell two friends. And before you know it, we have all this energy. Uh, the advantages of Geiger Mueller, uh, here we see again, small size, low cost, uh, disadvantages, uh, they are affected by vibration and they do have a temperature limit of about 120 degrees Celsius that you have to consider if you're in that kind of situation. Next one here is the ionization chamber. Get all this stuff out of here. Oops, shoot, didn't mean to do that. Uh, characteristics here, the ionization chamber uses a higher pressure argon gas, not specific about how much higher, uh, but higher, more than 14 kPa, and a bigger tube. Not sure how much bigger, but bigger. The ion chamber operates at a lower voltage than the Geiger-Muller, and the output is relatively independent of power supply fluctuations and vibrations, and generally, it is more robust. This is the old ILM diagram. This is the new ILM diagram. Uh, again, not going to drill you too hard on the pictures in any way, shape, or form, but construction, technology, uh, benefits, those are the types of things that we're looking at. Okay, last but not least here, we have the scintillation detector. Um, how does this one work? When the gamma photon strikes certain crystals, in this case sodium iodide, a visible light is produced and this goes back to that science of spectroscopic analysis that uh, we touched on really really quickly in uh, matter part a where uh, where scientists were trying to discover things and they and they learned that if they hit an atom with a certain type of energy the electrons uh, move up or down a level and as they do that they give off a certain time, type of light and we can identify elements by that type of light it's crazy but it's true so the light uh, from that crystal then strikes a photomultiplier tube uh, and then the photons from the photomultiplier tube are attracted to the positively charged dynodes, big fancy word here, and produce even more electrons. So it's like a 
amplifier, right? A photo multiplier, photo amplifier, if you want to call it that, to help remember. That works pretty good too. But here's what it looks like here. A uh, particle hits the, uh, the, photo, uh, the photo multiplying tube here, uh, and it bounces around. Every time it bounces there, it multiplies itself and creates uh, a current down at the end here, finally. Um, these resistors, these guys here, are used to provide voltage amplification for our signal. A lot of detail uh, for something that is, uh, you know, it's good, it's good knowledge. Let's leave it at that. Okay, uh, here's a tricky little installation mechanism here where we have uh, cascaded detectors uh, in order to provide us with a larger range uh, of measurements. So uh, we had continuous. The first uh, slide that we looked at had one long detector on there. Um, if you have a larger vessel, what they're basically saying here is you can stagger these or cascade them uh, and you can get much larger uh, ranges or spans. Okay, lengths uh, uh, up to three meters. That's where that was going. Uh, that's where I was going with that diagram there. All right, that was it for detectors. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, interference uh, radiation. So just something to consider uh, in terms of installation here. Uh, and this is true for any type of signal, whether it's an electronic signal or uh, radiation or um, whatever it might be. Uh, we want to, or analyzers for that matter, right? We want to be looking at something specific. We don't want interference from other things uh, and other, uh, you know, other things in an analyzer or whatever it might be. So ambient radiation has that same effect as it does in, in other applications that we've talked about earlier, uh, can cause false readings. Where do these, uh, where do these interferences come from? Uh, gamma, gamma, gamma graphy, I don't know if that's spelled right, but non-destructive testing. So when they come in and they do x-rays on pipes and things like that, uh, that's potential. Uh, lots of nuclear devices nearby, if that happens to be your, uh, happens to be your case. Uh, radioactive process media, uh, that does happen. Um, some of you may have heard of uh, norms. Uh, which is naturally occurring radioactive material, which is essentially anything that we pull out of the core of the earth has some level uh, of radioactivity to it. So to eliminate the effects of interference radiation, we can adjust the frequency uh, using something called a modulator in order to make it unique to the process. So it's just a way of uh, the source frequency modulator here is just a way of zeroing out uh, the radiation that's in the background. Moving into calibration, and calibration is relatively uh, simple for a nuclear source. There's essentially two methods. Uh, the first is called the PV level method, or I, uh, I like to call it a wet calibration if we're talking about level. Uh, for most other devices, I call it a wet uh, calibration, and this is simply uh, emptying the vessel uh, to your four milliamp level. Uh, and setting it at four milliamps and then filling the vessel up to its upper range value and setting the 20 milliamp uh, value. Um, that works uh, for most devices, regardless of the uh, application process, temperature, flow, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in level, uh, we're talking about adjusting the, adjusting the PV up and down. Uh, we can do it or simulate the same effect uh, in a nuclear device by closing the shutter. Uh, if you if you don't have the opportunity to you know empty and, and drain the vessel and most likely you well, most likely you won't um, unless you're in a startup situation. Uh, the second way to do it and probably this is more common is called the PV density method. Uh, it's similar to a pH calibration or an IR calibration. If you've done uh, fire detection uh, and you take the little uh, the little cards uh, and you block and you block the camera. Uh, same kind of idea. You basically take two different uh, density simulators uh, and, you, and you verify it with the lab. Um, one thing of keynote here is it's important that everything that will be in the path when operating is in place, uh, such as insulation, baskets, uh, supports, all that kind of stuff, because again, anything that gets in that beam is going to absorb some uh, radiation. Okay, here's the uh, here's an absorber plate. So uh, this is kind of uh, 
what is this? Run calibration from two different densities and verify with the lab. All right, so two methods. It seems to me like we're really talking about three. Uh, this is what I was comparing to um, fire detection. Um, but I don't know, the way my brain works does not necessarily mean it works uh, the same as yours. So this is called the absorber plate method here, and it uses what's called an equivalent uh, absorber to simulate different densities. We apply different plates made of lead or steel or different uh, materials in order to simulate different values. Uh, if the reading doesn't match the plate, then that usually identifies that there's some type of a problem, such as uh, a buildup in the pipe uh, or something, especially if it's changed uh, from previous uh, readings, uh, really indicative of something that has changed in the environment over time. Safety, finally, probably the most important section uh, in here in terms of uh, working with radiation is understanding uh, its dangers relative to you. So radiation uh, obviously can't be seen, smelled, tasted, heard, or touched. Uh, there are many regulations in place limiting um, our limits to exposure, exposure. So we have to consider all of these things. Uh, what are the limits? What type of sources are we dealing with? Uh, time, distance, and shielding, which we'll talk about in a second. Protective devices that we can use and the procedures that we uh, perform when we are uh, installing and removing these devices. So first off, exposure limits. Uh, what are they? Okay, a nuclear energy worker, or NEW as we'll call it from now on, uh, as defined by OHS, is 50 millisieverts per year. So you see nuclear energy worker, one year, 50 millisieverts. Uh, nuclear energy worker, five years, 100 millisieverts. Non-nuclear energy worker and non-nuclear energy worker, this would be this would be you in this category here. Uh, you're allowed one millisievert a year or a maximum of five over five years. Uh, the, 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 the minimum short-term dose necessary for the body to start showing physical effects is 250 millisieverts. So the, the, the limits are far, far lower than anything that's ever going to cause you uh, any type of damage. And we get exposed. We get exposed to this as private citizens easily uh, within the course of a year, probably, depending on what you do. But, uh, let's have a look. Different radiation sources. 76% uh, of our annual radiation exposure comes from natural sources. So don't don't think you're going to hide from it. Uh, things like radon gas, uh, radiation from the earth, and cosmic radiation. Uh, of which some of us have absorbed uh, more than others. Um, but a lot of other contributors to radiation uh, rather than a, than a radioactive source. Uh, usually in class, uh, I'll talk a, per, a little personal reference here. When I was a younger, when I was a younger man, uh, I got out of high school as about buck 90. Uh, I went to, went to work uh, in Banff for the summer with my girlfriend who was a ballet dancer and going to the School of Arts down there. Uh, went down there for the summer and had a great summer uh, working in Banff and I came back from that summer and I went from 189 pounds down to 149 pounds. So I went to the doctor and the doctor said, oh yeah, your thyroid's out of control. Uh, we can treat it a couple of ways. We can either operate on it and take some of it away or you can drink this uh, radioactive iodine and it will uh, it'll, it'll go through your body and it'll kill off your uh, thyroid gland and, and we'll treat it that way. So I said, all right, well, what would you do if I was your kid? And he said, well, I'd drink this stuff. So I did. Uh, and that drink uh, was a couple of ounces of radioactive iodine. And I don't exactly remember the total number off the top of my head, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 uh, millisieverts. So uh, scary as it may be, uh, we are exposed to a lot more radiation than we, than we think we are. But we don't want to be. So how do we deal with that? We mitigate the risk. Uh, and the catchphrase for mitigating the risk is called ALARA. Uh, and it stands for as low as reasonably achievable. So as low as reasonably achievable. We'll do what we can to uh, mitigate this risk. And how do we do that? 
three different factors. And we touched on these uh, several slides ago, uh, and now we're gonna address them in a little more detail. Time, uh, this one's pretty straightforward. Radiation is proportional to time. So uh, long story short, the longer you're in it, the more it's gonna hurt. So get in and out as fast as you can. So for example, if we're exposed to a dose of 100 microsieverts an hour for 10 hours, well, it's 10 times 100 or 1,000 microsieverts for one millisievert. So less time spent in that environment, the better. Okay, distance, uh, another good one. Um, <clears throat> radiation intensity decreases inversely with the square of the distance from the source, which is rather complicated, but you'll see the math here in a second, uh, uses uh, magical formula. We've seen this, uh, we've seen this formula before, but essentially what this formula tells us to do is if we double the original distance from the source, the intensity of the radiation drops to a quarter. So if I went double or two squared, I would be four or one quarter. If I went three squared, it would be nine or one ninth of its original value. So distance, the more we the more we put between us and the source, the better off, and little bits matter. Last but not least, uh, shielding. Okay, the radiation source itself uh, here is formed in a ceramic pellet placed in a double walled stainless steel capsule, uh, something like this. And I have an example uh, of one of these uh, in the classroom, actually. Um, but that doesn't help us, does it? Capsule is placed in a lead shielded source holder and the shield, of course, doesn't stop all the radiation, uh, but reduces it by a factor of whatever that material uh, is that it's in there. And it's usually lead. Okay, shielding that reduces intensity by one half is called HVL or, oh geez, I didn't put the abbreviation in there. Uh, it's half something something, not very good for me now. Forget that. Let me quickly look. I don't like no one. HBL. Dun, 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 dun. Half value layer. That's what it stands for, uh, which is a material that reduces uh, by half. And again, it depends on uh, depends on the properties of that particular material. And more layers, of course, means less intensity. Okay, the intensity at 30 centimeters from the source holder, and this is an important one here, cannot exceed five millirogans per hour or 50 milli micro sieverts per hour. And we'll talk a little bit more about this number, I believe, before this presentation uh, is over. Okay, protective devices. Uh, we'll be quick on this little section here. Uh, protective devices, they include uh, badge dosiometers, dosiometer, uh, electronic dosimeters and survey meters, and we'll talk about them uh, all very briefly in this presentation here. Um, but body badges are something uh, that you may or may not have seen if you worked with radiation, radiation in the field. Um, the difference between these two different types here is, of course, one's electronic and they'll give you uh, basically live, uh, live readings and alarms that'll tell you if you're in a bad spot. Whereas these ones here, uh, well, they kind of, they got to be sent away and they'll tell you after the fact if you've had a bad day. Uh, same idea with the ring dosimeter. Uh, it doesn't tell you what's going on right now. Um, you got to send it away and then they'll inform you whether or not you've had a bad day uh, later on. But there are more details associated with this and I think I talk about them uh, a little bit. So long story short, with most of these, uh, the radiation excites electrons uh, in the base construction material stores it until the lab can measure it somehow and the technology is different between uh, the different types um, and they measure generally its effect indicated by some type of visible light and we'll talk about how they get this visible light uh, briefly in the next slide i believe so dose meters here again uh, they follow kind of a technical progression uh, not that one this one should be over here if we're talking that way but uh, they've evolved over the years um, from film badges, uh, film badges, uh, which are just like camera film, but they react to radiation and you send it away to essentially get quote unquote developed and they'll tell you how much radiation you've been exposed to. 
uh, thermoluminescent devices here. Uh, they're, they're constructed with uh, crystals that trap radiation energy um, that creates electrons. And I don't really need you to uh, necessarily explain all of them, um, but be able to um, ex explain the three different types at least. Um, the operation of these ones here, once they've, uh, these crystals have trapped these electrons, they reheat them. Uh, and then uh, energy is released in the form of light, and then that's measured with a photomultiplier tube. So this one here, photomultiplier tube, uses heat. And then it progressed one more time here to optically stimulated luminescence, or OSL, where electrons, again, are captured in this time called uh, a dosimeter trap. And then they get stimulated with laser light, and they also give off light, which is measured. So uh, similar but different, um, be uh, mildly uh, educated on, on the uniqueness between the different technologies here. Okay, electronic personal meter, uh, as I said earlier here, uh, provides immediate information and alarming capabilities. Geiger counter or survey meter, this is the one that uh, most people picture in their heads when they talk about uh, measuring radiation, or you hear the term Geiger counter. This is uh, this is the machine. Uh, this is the type of device that you would use to check for radiation locally, such as uh, after locking out a source holder. And one of the drills uh, when you lock out a source holder is you got to go around with one of these at 30 centimeters and make sure you don't have uh, X numbers of uh, millisieverts or millirocans uh, in order to verify that the, the sh uh, shutter is effective. Um, still in use today, uh, I know when I worked at a prominent uh, plastics plant uh, east of town here, uh, one of our monthly PMs was to do a function check uh, on this thing and change the D batteries or check the D batteries in it. So they're still out there. Okay, again, uh, like I just said here, um, what do you do with these instruments before taking measurements? Uh, you got to verify uh, calibration in the last 12 months. This is a Canadian Nuclear Safety Council requirement. Uh, you verify that, uh, or check, I guess, that the batteries are good and change them if you need to. And then you do a verification check against a, a test sample, uh, just to make sure that it's, that it's functioning properly. All right, oh yes, uh, here is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, the process of taking a radioactive source in and out of service. First thing, inspect the holder. Then close the shutter and confirm that it's closed. Then you measure the field strength at 30 centimeters around the holder, and it's not to exceed 50 millisieverts. Um, then you to install the source. Then uh, or, or you install the source. Then uh, again measure 30 centimeters perpendicular to the holder in the on and off positions, uh, without measuring, of course, the main beam. Record your data. Display signage document location. So I didn't get into super amount of details here. Uh, the important one, oops, the important one here is uh, number three here, measuring at 30 centimeters and the value that you can't exceed. Okay, signage. Uh, where there is a nuclear device, there must be signage, especially in a confined space. Uh, so common signage. Maximum, uh, oops, sorry, I thought that was the same slide. Uh, leak test, again, um, if sources have a half-life of six months or more and a radioactive, uh, radioactivity greater than 50 megabecrels, they must be tested every 12 months and maximum allowable leakage is 50 megabecrels. So lots of, uh, lots of very general information in there uh, dealing with radiation today. Uh, again, uh, technologies, applications, unique differences, and then, of course, uh, the safety variables uh, that are important for us when we're working on them. Um, so that's, uh, that's nuclear measurement. Any questions? <laughs>